Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Dog Q&A number 28. Today, we're going to talk with Tammy, the owner of Bed and Bones in San Juan Capistrano, California, and she's going to give us insider tips on doggy daycare. Tammy, take it away. Thank you for coming. <laughs> I thank you, Tricia. And um, thank you for having me today. And I'm not positive what everybody wants to learn because I have a deluge of information and I will try not to overwhelm. So I'll let uh, Trisha also kind of navigate me on what she thinks most people want to hear because I definitely don't want to inundate anybody with too much information. Um, I am an animal lover. I have been in animal husbandry for over three decades. Um, I have been a bird breeder and I bred Asian um, parakeets for zoos and did that for quite a while, um, doing that on a quarter acre and then we moved to 15 acres. Um, then I got involved in 4-H with goats and chickens and um, I've also been a dog breeder and which led to bed and bones. People started asking me to watch their dogs. I decided to create it into a business and so I've been doing that for the last 16 years. And has Bed and Bones been around for the 16 years? That is correct. 16 okay. years is when it's been an official business. Wow. And so tell us about um, how it's set up. What's the, the atmosphere there, the layout? Because it's more of a ranch style, correct? So describe that a little bit. Yeah, we're located here in California. And where we are is um, Southern California. So it's very difficult to get land. And the mere fact that we have land where we can have dogs outside is very unique for our area. In Texas, they're probably all outdoors, but for California, it's very different. We make sure that the dogs are playing most of the day outdoors. We believe that fresh air, running, natural terrain is what's best for a dog. So we try to keep them outside as much as we can. And do you have unique things you have to um, prepare people for or prepare the dogs for, for being outside versus inside? Um, yeah, and, and I always tell people when you're looking for doggy daycare, just because we're outside, that may not be the best thing for your dog. So you always wanna look at what's best for you and what's best for your dog. Um, outside is great for some dogs, but also it can get very hot in Southern California. So all of our short nosed breed dogs, the Frenchies, the Bulldogs, you know, anything with that short snout of boxer can get overheated very easily. So on our 100 degree days, those dogs are gonna be rotated in and out of air conditioning because that's going to be troublesome. Mm -hmm. If you're in an area that's snowy and you have winters and you have a dog with a very short coat, that may be an issue for you for being outdoors. So there's definitely um, choices to make um, indoors versus outdoors. And things to think about like rain. You know, you don't have snow so much, but rain is an issue. We do, and what we've done is um, the dogs don't care about the rain. It's usually the people. <laughs> so what we've done is we put up wedding a uh, wedding tent. So what you see for a wedding that would happen in the rain, we've done that for the dogs because they're still getting the fresh air and not being inside, mm -hmm. and still able to play and not be wet. But to be honest, most of the dogs love the rain. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of dogs like mud too. <laughs> yes, yes. And we have a creek alongside of our property. And there was a time frame where we would take the dogs down to the creek and just let them run and play in the creek. We no longer do that because the dogs go home so muddy that people are like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and so um, you also offer bathing, I think, too, as well, right? Yes, we do um, an exit bath for dogs that are here because again, when you pick an outdoor facility, if you have the fluffy white poodle, when they come in, we always tell them, you may wanna get them clipped short or you are going to have probably a gray dog when you go home. And I'm sure that would be fun for nobody <laughs> with a fluffy white dog. <laughs> so, okay, so what do you expect from the owners when they're bringing dogs? And what, tell us about this, the process too, the screening process and all of that. Um, and I think for everybody, they think of doggy daycare as a panacea for every dog. But I always tell people, 
it's not for every dog. I'm an owner of six dogs. I had two of my dogs that could not come to doggy daycare. They were not built for doggy daycare. So I always say you have to take a look at the dog that you have. And one dog, Trisha, you probably remember was from the Pasadena Animal Shelter. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so we have an Anatolian Shepherd that is 160 pounds. Doggy daycare is not for him. His job is protection and he doesn't really want anybody else to be boss. So that wasn't for him. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people you have to be um, kind of honest with yourself on whether it's right. So if a person calls, the first thing we ask them is, does your dog, um, has your dog been neutered or spayed? If it has not been, we probably are not the right place. And not to say that you cannot make the decision that you want your dog unneutered or unspayed, but mm -hmm. it does not make for a very good environment. If you have a dog, come, one dog that's unneutered will create chaos in a doggy daycare. So every dog needs to be neutered or spayed. We ask for that by five months. If their dogs are not, then we ask them just to wait about a month after they have been spayed or neutered and to bring them in. If we have puppies here, we watch the puppy and we can tell when the testosterone starts to build because all the dogs will become much more interested in that dog and it will be get, it will really be uncomfortable for the unneutered dog and we know when it's time for to get that dog neutered. Again, some people are um, adamant about not neutering for up to a year mm -hmm. and that's their prerogative. Um, the dog also needs to have all its vaccines. In California, we need rabies. We need the distemper parvo um, combination um, vaccine. And we also need Bordetella, which is for um, canine cough. Do they require, um, do you have leptospirosis down there being a ranch? Um, it's funny because we used to also always require it. Now it's not required, but we do tell people that it's a good idea to have it, but it really depends upon the vet. So some vets um, offer it and some vets do not in California. Oh, okay, okay. And how many dogs do you take at a time? We personally, even though with, we have 15 acres, we do a maximum of 40 dogs. And that's, I have a cat crying. <laughs> we have, um, we have um, that's for daycare, boarding and grooming. So we have to kind of manage it. Now we have places in town that take 300 dogs. So it varies by facility. I know personally as an owner, I put my hand on every dog. So I wanna know if the dog is eating, if the dog is defecating normally, if the dog is feeling right. When I get to be over 40 dogs, I, have, I don't have that, that visibility any longer. So for me personally, $40 is my personal maximum that I feel comfortable with. Because you wanna make sure personally yourself that each dog is getting the right care and is healthy and and that it is a good fit for them to be there. Right. And again, when you have doggy daycare, that means dogs are playing together. Mm -hmm. So there comes a time where um, you have to know that it is safe for every dog because the whole process of daycare is that every dog is having fun, no bullying, and every dog feels safe and the owners feel safe with you taking care of the dogs. So it is a balance. It's a balance with dogs. It's a balance with um, age of dogs, breed of dogs, play styles of dogs, um, as well as uh, um, personnel. So a lot of it comes down to how the dogs are being managed in the group. And so that, you know, you have to have employees to do that. And so what would you suggest people look for in terms of how many employees are there, how big the groups are, how they're separated, that kind of thing. Um, I think that would be very, very difficult for a lot of people to tell because mm -hmm. personally, if I put my husband in the yard, he can handle 30 dogs, every dog respects him, and I know that every dog is safe. I take a brand new employee, I will give them five dogs and I will be standing over their shoulder to help manage because it is a um, clear distinction that some dogs know who they respect and who they must respect and who they, you know, can get away with, you know, they're like two-year-olds. I can get away with that. I don't have to do that. So, and I have to say that at our facility, we do a trial, which means the dog has to come in for two hours. 
A lot of people don't like that trial because it is a big time out of your day, pretty much eats up your day. Um, you bring your dog, we chat while your dog is on, your, on a leash while you're holding it. We start watching the dog as soon as you exit your vehicle. And we are taking notes of exactly what your dog looks like and how it's reacting. We sit and chat for about five or 10 minutes to just let the um, customer know, human customer, what, how we operate, what our facility is like and um, what their dog's day looks like. Mm -hmm. When we feel like the dog is ready to walk over to us, it is sniffed, it seems relaxed, some of them don't seem relaxed, I'll ask them to hand me the leash and then I'll stand there for a few more minutes and hold the leash. I always tell the owner, don't make a big goodbye. Mm -hmm. Don't even make eye contact. I'm gonna walk away, you're gonna get in your car and you're gonna drive off. Don't slow down, don't, you know, none of that. Just be confident, drive away. Mm -hmm. We will take their dog and we'll put it into what we call a howdy area. This enables the dog to come in Dogs are all around them because every dog will rush over to the howdy area to smell that dog. This new dog can then take its time and smell the other dogs. We will wait for that dog's body language to show us it's relaxed. If it does not relax, we move all the dogs to another section of the yard. We close the gate and we'll leave two or three dogs that could care less if a new dog has shown up. We want the dog, the new one, to enter the yard with confidence. If its tail is tucked in, if the hackles are up, if it's feeling overwhelmed, we, that, that is all of a sudden gonna be a negative for that dog for our facility. So we try and do everything we can to build confidence. You also have the dog that is like, I've just arrived at Disneyland and I'm gonna come in and run hundred miles an hour. That also is not a great environment. We also will remove move dogs for that type of dog as well. Mm -hmm. um, the high energy dog that just wants to run is actually more dangerous mm -hmm. than the shy, shy submissive. We tell them, I can look at the dog in the parking lot and tell her, your dog is gonna run a hundred miles an hour. Every dog will chase it. It will turn around and go, oh my gosh, everybody's chasing me. And then turn around and go, now I'm freaked out. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. So we always tell them, one of the things we work on is getting that dog to lower its um, energy level to about 70% instead of playing at 100%. So a lot of it is dog training all day long. And, and some dogs, there's homework for the owner and we'll tell them, these are the things you have to work on. Um, some people are not willing to work on it and they need to get a trainer. But we actually don't train dogs while we're here. Even though we're training them in the yard, mm -hmm. we can't do one-on-one -on -one with a dog in the yard in our facility. Yeah, that's such a good point about the group dynamic. It's so much different. And one dog can set off the entire group and disrupt the whole thing. And I yeah. know, in, when you've got a balanced group and then you put a new dog in, it's going to change no matter what. Correct. But you don't want it to go way over the deep end in any direction. <laughs> we, we laugh and we say a dog fight is kind of like a bar fight. It starts with a look and a bump. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Yeah. Yes. So um, we will have a dog that ha doesn't have an aggressive bone in his body. But if he keeps running fast and bumps into an older grumpy dog that's trying to lay in the sun, that older grumpy dog is gonna give a correction, rah, 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 which is totally appropriate because it just said, hey, you just bumped into me. Mm -hmm. So our goal in a yard is we have to teach those dogs. You don't say rah, rah, rah. You look to the person in the yard and say, this dog is bothering me. And then the person in the yard goes over and says, leave it or gives a command to the dog, which that dog then needs to respond to. If the dogs don't respond in our facility, we have a timeout. And the dogs, just like children, will go for a one minute timeout. If they are barking, they do not come out of the timeout. We stand in front of the dog and we wait. And the second that it's quiet, we will let them out of the timeout. So we never want to reward um, behavior we don't want. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that we're always rewarding good behavior. And I have to tell you, we have not found a dog that is like, doesn't like really take the call, time out to heart. It just calms everything down. It brings them back to a new level and it's like a restart button. Mm -hmm. And would you say 
so say you have a dog who is maybe at the maximum energy level that you can take. How many timeouts would that dog need? You know, what's the, of the most extreme example, how many timeouts would you need to give a dog before they start to understand, I need to be calm in this group? Oh, that is just such a good question because we have um, dogs that are just happy-go-lucky that really, um, they will go into a timeout every hour at the beginning, every hour. They just start it all over again. Oh, a new dog's arrived. I'll just, it's like a whole new um, rule because it's a new dog. So it starts all over again, or you take out a ball, it starts it all over again. So um, it's funny, but after they've been with us for a while, they usually get it. But we have a, um, a Doberman that comes at least three times a week and she knows when she's done something wrong and she just goes and stands in front of the timeout and says, fine, put me in. So she knows, she, she knows she's incorrect, but she's willing to take the time out for it anyway. So, so funny. yeah. <laughs> and then we have the ones that are very sensitive that will follow the dog to the timeout and stand next to him and go, I feel so bad for you, you're in timeout. <laughs> I just wanna play with you. I'm sorry yeah. that you're in there. <laughs> yeah. And we also know that when we get a new dog that is very excitable, there are dogs that will go, oh no, you're going to be in trouble. I'm going to watch you because you're going to time out. <laughs> <laughs> dogs are very perceptive. I think much more than people realize. Well, and I have to tell you that in um, one of the things that we train our employees on is we tell them the dogs will tell you way ahead of time what's going to happen but you just have to be alert and watch the body language. So there was a dog that we had to decline and we declined it because it was doing a nose bump. Mm -hmm. And so what it would do is any dog that wanted to play, it would bump the dogs over and over. And a dog gives a cutoff signal that says, I don't wanna play with you. And it does it in a multitude of ways, but it's obvious that the dog does not wanna play. This dog repetitively just bumped. So when I told the owner, we have an issue with your dog and a nose bump. And it's like a 13 year old boy punching you in the arm. After a while, you're just gonna be annoyed with it. Mm -hmm. And the owner said to me, oh yeah, that's how our dog asked to be pet. It bumps us and then we pet it. <laughs> yeah, so that was created in the home. And so if they're not willing to do anything about it, there's no way that we can follow that dog around and make sure he doesn't nose bump because he's getting rewarded at home for it. But for sure, if he does that to the wrong dog, that will end up in a dog fight. So wow. we're also um, training dogs with social behavior. Dogs that live at home, one-on-one, -on -one, never around other dogs, they, they're missing those social cues of, of how they're supposed to react with other dogs. And so in a doggy take care environment, that's teaching them, okay, this is how I need to react. Um, that dog just growled at me, completely appropriate, because a growl, remember, is not a bite. We never, we never like reprimand for a growl. It's a warning. You never want a dog to go straight to a bite, correct? Mm -hmm. So then it warns us and say, okay, you're annoying. You need to leave it. This dog is fine. So it's a constant process of, of teaching. And we can tell the dogs that have had good training while they were young and the ones that um, they thought I got a lab and I left it in the backyard and it should be good to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like daycare and having a group of dogs reveals a lot of the dog's um, personality and issues at the same yes. time. Yes, and, um, and to be honest with um, the doggy daycare, we are, um, a lot of people have gone to um, leaving their dogs with the neighbor, the boy down the street. Um, uh, there are new um, businesses, app-based businesses, where you just drop your dog off at somebody's home. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, um, as a warning, that you need to really be careful with that. Because understand, when you drop your dog off at a doggy daycare, it's licensed. Um, there are people managing how they do business. There are emergency protocols of what will take place in emergency. Those things don't happen when you're dropping off um, at Joe's down the street. You don't know what dogs are there, how, um, um, how educated the person is. Uh, will they go out to run an errand and the dogs are unmanaged? So I always tell people, 
be sure that when you're leaving your dog that it's in the safest place you can. And if there is an issue that there is um, like some way to go back and remedy it if something happens. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think you mentioned to me earlier about um, emergency protocols. Like that's such an important thing to have. And what do you guys have in terms of emergency protocol? And what kind of things do you have to, what are your emergencies that you typically have? Um, I would say in California, we don't have the snow, but we have the heat. And what can happen in California is if the heat is too high, we will have something called rolling blackouts. And that is the, um, that's our electrical company deciding, oh, we're gonna shut off power here, here, here mm -hmm. to save on power. Well, if you have a whole group of dogs and it's too hot and they need air conditioning and our dogs all go for a nap time in the middle of the day. So it needs to be air conditioning. We need to give them a time to cool down, rest, mm -hmm. um, have lunch with their puppies or didn't eat their breakfast. So we truly believe in a nap time. So if that happens, we have generators. So we have to be prepared that we have generators running, we can still keep dogs cool. Mm -hmm. um, in a place where it snows, um, they may have, I know that when we've gone to New York, they had an ice storm and all their power was out. So mm -hmm. the same is probably true in that scenario where there has to be backup power. Mm -hmm. We also have fires in California. We know that they can happen. We've seen them come over our hill before. We have put our emergency protocol into effect. We take the dogs, we load them into crates, we have trailers, we're ready to pull off the property. We pull the emergency form and we're ready to call the owners and say, this is where we're going. Um, being that we're in a horse town, we put a call out to um, a local horse community, um, a stable. Our entire street was filled with people in their horse trailers. So I have to tell you that I know now that in our community, we have hundreds of places we can go. We know our dogs all get along. Um, people have offered us, we have a barn, we have an arena. We know that our dogs are safe. We also make sure that every person that goes on a vacation, that they leave an emergency number of somebody that's left behind. So it's not you while you're in Kentucky and we're in California, it's your neighbor, it's your aunt, they don't necessarily want to take care of your dog, but if there was an emergency, they could come pick it up. That's a great point. Yes. And the one thing that I always wonder is when you have 300 dogs, how will you evacuate all those yeah. dogs? Yeah. Yeah. Especially when there's a group of 50 dogs together, how are you going to separate 50 dogs versus if you have 10 or 15, you know? Well, one of the things that we do during our trial is we, um, we have a whole series of things that we make the dogs do. One of them is a collar grab. And um, the back of the collar, is a, this area is a very dominant area for a dog. So some dogs, when you go to grab the back of their collar, they will turn around and mouth you. They will put on the brakes. They will have a whole series. So we will grab the collar and we will move them. And so we have to know that we can do that. If we cannot do that, and we can see we cannot do that, then we give that as a homework assignment for the owner and say, periodically grab the back of the dog's collar and just leave it a few feet around the house and never say a word. So that they just get used to, if I pull you somewhere, you're just gonna willingly go. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the dog needs to go into a crate. What we've learned in California is if there is a fire and you throw your dog in the car and then you come back out to go grab your passport and your medication, everything else, when you open that door, that dog will jump out and you will lose your dog. So we know in California, you put the dog in um, the crate in the car, you load the dog in, you shut it, you turn on your car in the air conditioning and you go get the rest of your things. So we make sure that every dog is willing to go into a crate. Mm -hmm. And when you, um, that's what one thing I was gonna actually ask you is do they need to be crate trained? And at least to some degree they do. And um, I have to tell you, most people will start out with crate training when they're small. Mm -hmm. And then they'll say, oh, I tossed the crate. And I yep. say, well, I can go into a garage cell and you're going to go pick up a new crate. And you put a fluffy bed inside of it and the best treats that he never gets, you throw them in and make sure the door is locked open. So it's not used as a negative, but change it to an area where the dog 
will learn to love the crate. And that way, when you have to use it in the future, or if somebody comes over and you're like small children and maybe your dog needs a safe space, they will put themselves in the crate. Yeah, it's the same principle of um, giving them a nap time is they want to rest. They need yes. rest. They can't yeah. handle. And I know so many clients will say, oh, we can't do training today because my dog was at daycare yesterday and he's too exhausted. You know, and there's so many times and it doesn't take long for some dogs. Two hours might be enough for some dogs to become worn out. Yes. The, after the two hour trial, I've never heard somebody say their dog didn't come home and sleep for six hours straight. It's not only um, uh, physical um, stress, but it's mental stress. Mm -hmm. The other thing we know about um, scent training, and we've got a lot of scent trials and people are using that, that even smelling can exhaust a dog. Mm -hmm. So when we have dog trainers that are doing scent training, the dog will come in exhausted from that. So smelling through their nose is enrichment, but it's also tiring. And being on a ranch with smells that they don't have in their homes, that's exhausting even for a dog that lays down and doesn't move a lot. That's such a good point. And so tell us about a day in the life of a dog who has passed their trial and now they're coming for a day of daycare. What does that look like as far as um, when does the day start? Where are the nap times? When do they go to bed? And, and that's a good point too with people because we open at seven o'clock. And so if your daycare doesn't open early enough, if you're a person that has to get to work and start by seven, our place mm -hmm. would never work for you. So you always want to look at the things, the constraints of the daycare you're looking at and make sure it matches up with your requirements because you can't expect the daycare to change their requirements for what fits your schedule. So we open at seven so people can start dropping their dogs right at seven in the morning. They will go out into the big yard. The dogs that are boarding will go out at the same time. So they'll go out into their various yards, either small dogs, big dogs. We separate them by play styles and size. And they will go out and use the bathroom and do their, get their drinks and run around. Then we bring them in and they all um, take a rest first thing in the morning. And usually between 7.30 and eight, um, the dogs have eaten now, had their breakfast. Uh, we let the, the food settle in their stomachs and everybody comes back out at eight. Dogs continue to arrive till usually about 10 or 10.30 and that's the latest we'll let a drop off happen because the dogs will start going in 11.30. Um, there'll be puppies that need lunch. We'll have dogs that haven't had breakfast or, or, or only fed once a day in the middle of the day. They drop off their lunch. Every dog gets a grain-free treat and our dogs love nap time. They all line up next to the fence. They're waiting there, they know what time it is. We will let them in, they will run to their spots. Most of them come on a regular basis. They have a regular spot they like. They will run right to it. Um, they're snoring usually before the lights turned off. At 2.30, they all come back out. And at three o'clock we open our gate so people can start to pick up and they will play. And because we have daylight savings and it's dark at five, they're all in by five now. Mm -hmm. We do a late let out. So the dogs will come back out um, for a potty break in the night. We kind of run it like our home. Um, your home dogs usually get a potty break before you go to bed, they'll get the same. Last potty break and then they come in. You have to understand with a, um, an indoor facility, your dog is required to um, urinate and defecate inside. So you also have to know your dog. There are some dogs that don't have a problem with that. We have had owners come to us say they picked up their dog after two days at an indoor facility as they got the dog outside by the car, it urine and defecated right outside the car. And that's from a dog that's been holding it and trying to be, you know, what they think is appropriate as they weren't allowed to go in that facility. So in that sense, you need to know that about your dog as well. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, um, does it, because I've also had dogs who wouldn't potty on a leash. Do you ever have an issue like that? Well, we wouldn't know because our dogs don't have to potty on a leash. Oh, okay. So all well, let you. off. But okay. we have had, we have some artificial turf to keep the okay. clean dogs clean. We have a gravel area that's um, rocks because some dogs like to potty on rocks. And then we also have natural dirt and just a natural kind of an outdoor area because there's some dogs that like to potty on that. 
So we literally have multiple areas so a dog can choose mm -hmm. where they feel most comfortable, um, you know, relieving themselves. Yeah, that's a great option because some dogs will only go on grass or only on whatever the substrate is at home that they're used to. They may have never tried a different kind. Yes, that is mm -hmm. correct. And some dogs will learn after a while and go, oh, he's going over there. I can go over there. But if a dog is kept in a, um, in a structure, you know, either a suite or whatever you want to call it, and they're eating in that same area, a dog usually will not want to defecate where it eats. Mm -hmm. So that's what will constitute the holding of their, you know, their bowels is like, I can't eat here and defecate in the same area. So you're going to have to know your dog, whether that is something that they're actually able to, um, you know, accomplish. Yeah. And those are the dogs that have to potty on the leash and hopefully they can. Yes. Well, um, in California and it may be different other areas, we have areas where the dogs are not able to ever go outside. They are always inside. So, and, and I have to say that's not anything negative with other owners that has to do with our zoning in California and what your local um, city and county decides as far as rules go. They have decided that inside is a better decision for dog boarding businesses. And they, they come up with that because of the barking. Yeah. But I always tell people when they come to our facility, I always say to them, do you hear any dogs barking? There's never any barking. And they go, you're right. There's no barking. And I say, the reason there's no barking is because first of all, we tell them that they can bark twice. So if they see something and they bark, we walk over and go, oh, good dog, no more bark. So we've acknowledged it. We've rewarded the two bark and that's all you get. A dog will then go have um, issues of timeout if they continue to bark. So they quickly learn barking is not appropriate. Um, if you have a facility where there's constant barking, they've done studies to see how it raises anxiety in dogs. Mm -hmm. Um, they tried putting dogs that bark all in one separate area. So there was just massive barking and, um, that was horrible for every dog that was in there. So the goal is that we don't need to bark, that we can play without barking. We can run without barking. We can, we can, um, acknowledge without barking. So, um, as, if every facility worked that way, I think that we'd have more dogs that could be outside um, in different cities. Yeah, I worked at an animal shelter that that's all dogs do is bark and it, it creates stress in the people and the dogs, everything. And there, yeah. there was a time when they played music to calm the dogs over the speakers and it was quiet and everything was so peaceful and everybody just wanted to come and walk through. <laughs> And for some reason they outlawed that and it went back to barking, but it was oh. just such a difference. Yes, and we do play music during nap time and mm -hmm. at night. Um, during 4th of July or New Year's when you have fireworks, we make sure that we play music that is very loud because we have people that will drop off our dogs just for those times of year mm -hmm. because of how stressed their dogs are. And we have other dogs that could care less. So they're watching the reactions of their other dogs and um, they're not stressed. So we make sure that um, music does play a huge part in keeping dogs very calm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I learned as a zookeeper too in the bird room. When we put on classical music, they all went silent. And then they yeah. were so peaceful. In there. <laughs> Animal, well, you know from birds. <laughs> Yes, yes, and but we have a noisy bird, so there you have that. Yeah, yeah. is it yeah. still the African gray? Oh yeah, and just uh, because I think what we've learned is African grays can learn and live. So he's already thirty years old, oh, and he'll probably good. he'll probably live till he's seventy five. He's very healthy. So um, the problem is, I used to bring him down to the dog business, but he quickly learned that he could annoy the dogs by making cat sounds by um, going, you wanna go for a walk? You wanna go for a walk? So yeah, we can't have him down there anymore. He's very annoying. I remember he used to imitate a phone ringing. Yes. When you'd walk out to the yard, the second you went in, the phone would ring and you walk all the way back, no phone ringing. 
And then you realize, oh, it's the bird. And then he's yeah. laughing, you know. <laughs> yes, he, he basically is smarter than most of us. Yes. Now, we've noticed even with dogs, like we use walkie talkies on the um, business. So mm -hmm. notify of, um, can you, I need backup. Um, somebody's coming, arriving to the business. The golf cart is going to go by. Some dogs, the golf cart, the way that it moves sparks um, like, uh, prey drive. So we want to um, get those dogs before the golf cart goes by. So we use walkie talkies, but we also will walk talkie and go, oh, Jenna's owners just arrived. And so the dogs are like, Ooh. so yeah, it's funny how quickly they know or um, mm -hmm. coming in to put dogs in for nap time. And it's like, oh, so yeah, mm -hmm. the dogs are very keen on listening to everything. And you now, still, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. You still live on the property, correct? Yes. Um, I truly think that any facility has to have somebody there 24 seven. And I know that we have, um, we've got our security cameras, we have, you know, all those things, but it's how quickly if you needed to get there mm -hmm. that you, you know, you need to know that. So, um, yeah. and a lot of the facilities, I know for another one that's out in um, Riverside County that um, she rotates her employees and everybody spends a night two or three um, days each week. So mm -hmm. um, that happens. Wow. Oops. Oh, yeah. there you are. So, um, yeah, I, my, I had switched devices, so I'm going to switch it to getting some power because it's telling me I'm low power. I understand. There we go. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, so uh, definitely having somebody on site is very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing I was going to tell you is uh, as far as picking a facility, one of the things that we know is that um, if there is any kind of an issue with the dog, we have what's called an incident report and a repetitive behavior report. Mm -hmm. And that seems silly maybe to a lot of people, but we know our yard people. Uh, be repetitive behavior is if we have a dog that has tendencies of bullying another dog, and that can be biting around the neck, it can be not listening to the cutoff signals, it can be um, a multitude of things, mm -hmm. then they will write up a report and say, um, uh, Alan uh, mounted hazelnut 16 times or whatever. So he was in, or, and the thing is, is in our facility, they never get to the point of mounting. We know just how they posture around a dog that they're about to mount. And even that posturing will then, um, it will then cause them to have a timeout, but it also provides us an incident report that goes into their file. We, we will tell the owner, um, hey, this is what we noticed. We haven't seen this before. Um, we're reprimanding for this. And a lot of times I'll say, well, my dog plays with my son's dog and we allow that or whatever. So if that doesn't come into line with what we need, then that could be a reason why a dog can no longer come to play. Um, we also notice if a dog has loose stools, that will go on the report. If there's blood in the urine or the stool, if the dog is um, over salivating, anything we see that's unusual will go on that incident report. And then we can report back to the owner and go, hey, this is what we saw, so that they know that we're paying attention to what's going on with their dog and that they're paying attention to how their dog is reacting. Yeah, that's true with the medical too. You just need someone always paying attention for anything new and unusual. Yes. And um, for the most part, we're seeing the dogs at least once a week, if not more. And so we had a dog that came in a, two weeks ago and somebody noticed that there was um, like kind of a hematoma on the foot. Mm. We told the owner, took a picture of it with the camera, took, told the owner, the owner goes, that's weird. I've never seen that before. Hmm. And so took the dog to a vet and it was something that required medical attention and fairly quickly. Wow. So, yeah. So the vet sees your dog once a year, some, some people twice a year. So they don't really get to check your dog over um, carefully as a groomer or, you know, um, being in a facility would. So um, that's another benefit of just having your dog. 
And, and I have to say that doggy daycare leads to you being able to take a vacation and your dog being comfortable. That is the number one reason why I tell people they should um, have their dogs in a social environment, unless you plan on boarding them where they never around another dog. And that is also an option. But if you want them in a facility where they're playing and social and having fun, you need to start that with your trainer when it's four months old. Hmm. That's so true. And even the critical socialization period ends at 12 weeks. And so many vets say, don't take your puppy out until 16 weeks when they're fully vaccinated. So we see a lot of issues with that. What's the youngest puppy age you take? We have to have them vaccinated, but I have to tell you that as a dog breeder, I started my puppies at eight weeks on their, vac um, on their vaccination schedule. I also am a firm believer that I had them all neuter and spayed at five months. And people don't agree with that. And they'll say they don't live as long, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'm here to tell you that my Jack Russell, 19 years old, I don't know what to tell you. We, she had all her vaccines by the time she was 10 weeks. We had her socializing early. Um, we needed to make sure that, you know, things were in line. So uh, it's your choice, but I do believe, and that's why a lot of times if you start with a, um, a trainer, they'll have their own dog. And so they will help socialize your puppy with one of their dogs. Or they'll have two puppies at the same time and they'll socialize them together or they may be training multiple dogs. So we always say it's a really good idea to get your trainer on board as a puppy. You can avoid a lot of the bad um, habits that will happen by not seeing a trainer until it's 10 months old, 11 months old, 18 months old. Yeah, even what, when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with a puppy, I tell them to go to a puppy class. Yes. Get the social yes. skills. Yes. And um, we always find that um, a lot of the dogs end up in shelters between nine and 18 months. Mm -hmm. And that's usually because the, the owners can no longer handle the bad behaviors and they give up. Mm -hmm. And if you had started early by nine months, you might have some like reverting back because they do go through that teenage kind of stage, but you'll quickly know the skills of how to pull that right back in line. Mm -hmm. And I really think that we would have a lot less dogs in the shelter. Yeah, a lot of people I've seen, you know, over the last decade, an increase in reactivity in dogs, just in the training world and in the shelter world. And um, just in the pet population in general, do you find the same, do you see the same thing <clears throat> in daycare dogs as well? Yes. Um, and, um, and usually, I mean, I hate to say this, but a lot of times, like, I will know that it's the owner. I'll mm -hmm. see an owner that is highly um, uh, reactive and um, creates anxiety. And I'll look at the husband and say, um, do you find that your dog yeah. behaves differently around you than your wife? And he'll go, yep. And I go, I want you to come pick up the, your dog and not your wife, mm. because it will be a completely different um, uh, situation when the husband picks up. And then sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes the husband's the problem and the wife is the more calm person. But what we've noticed during like um, this year when dogs have spent an enormous amount of time with their owners, mm -hmm. we have had issues with dogs that we've seen since they were young, but all of a sudden coming back for the first time in six or nine months or whatever that have, are having issues that we have never seen with those dogs. Wow. That yeah. Isolation. Mm. yeah. Well, okay. So, um, what else have we not talked about in our last 15 minutes or so that you want to tell people about doggy daycare? <laughs> well, and I think it just boils down to um, being a good animal owner. And one of the things that um, a lot of people are getting, but not everyone, is um, diet with mm -hmm. dogs. You know how if you load up your kid on sugar. It's not going to be a kid that you want to be around. Well, we see dogs um, with the type of diets they are on 
that are not good for their dog. So I always tell people, you really need to consider what's going into your dog and what's coming out of your dog. Um, there are dogs that are super energetic that already have a high, high energy level. And when they give them a pure protein diet, mm. that dog is just like a racehorse. So consider how clean, we always tell people the first five ingredients, read it on your, on your dog food, consider what you're feeding, um, make sure that you're feeding something clean. I personally don't like foods that come out of um, the big box places. Go to your local pet store, pick up something um, that is a smaller manufacturer. They have quality um, standards that are very high. Um, I, I look to see what has had recalls. Um, I start to watch recalls. Um, ask your doggy daycare what they recommend because they're paying attention to the recalls. When you've had a couple of weird recalls, time to move on to a new food. Mm -hmm. And then also we talk a little bit about um, products that you use at home for cleaning, for shampooing your dog, um, what's on your floor, all those things. Because understand a dog licks it licks its paws, it licks its coat. Um, those things, all, everything that you use around your house eventually makes its way into your dog. And you're talking about like chemical cleaners and things like that. Yes, yes. What do you guys what, clean with there? What do you use? We are, <laughs> uh, and I'm gonna just like get a bunch of flag for this, but I am crazy. We live on a ranch, we have groundwater concerns. So I am over the top about what we clean with and what we use um, to wash their dishes with, their beds, everything. And we only use natural essential oil products. I mean, products for laundering, products for cleaning, products for getting rid of pests. Um, I am not a proponent of, of um, massive amount of um, flea and tick formulas on dogs every single month. Um, same with um, a lot of medications. I try and limit the things that we put into dogs. I'm not a proponent of um, vet or prescription dog foods. I find that a lot of them, the the ingredients may be good for a short period of time, but I say try and get them back on to a cleaner diet as quick as you can. But yeah, big, big. And I know Trisha and I have both gone to um, um, animal conventions of how to use um, essential oil safely with pets. I use them with my chickens. I use it with my African gray. Uh, people will tell me, oh, you're going to kill your animals. Well, let me just tell you, I am not somebody that has ever killed an animal. I can keep anything alive. <laughs> yeah, we had a pet nutritionist on a few weeks ago who talked about the importance of food. And she also uses young living oils like we do. And she, you know, it's just once you go down that healthy path, you eventually end up there, I feel like. Yes. <laughs> you find, yes. Oh, this one works really well. <laughs> We had, um, we had one woman that told us to, um, Young Living has a, an oil called Purification. We use it to keep rodents off the property. And for whatever reason, rodents do not like that smell. And so we will even take a drop and put it on our engines because the rodents will get into our cars and chew up wires that cost a phenomenal amount of money. So we will even use that in there. But the woman had said, spray, put the one drop of purification in a spray bottle and spray it in the chicken's water. So I had one chicken that had lost almost all of its feathers. And this wasn't through a molt. This had been other chickens just pulling out its feathers for whatever reason. So I started spraying it in their water once a day. Do you know that in 30 days, every single one of those chickens looked like they were ready for a show? <laughs> and I have, like, I can't even tell you why that happened, but I was like, that is incredible. That is amazing. And they're yeah. just Everyone hears different things about essential oils and all of that, but they're plants. If you use our natural product, it's just a plant. Yes, yes. Use it in the way it was intended to be used. 
We spray lavender, eucalyptus, and tea tree oil, and people hate tea tree oil, but Young Living's products are very pure, and they have no artificial ingredients. They have a seed to seal, so I use all three of those in every spray bottle, and I sprayed, and since I started using that probably eight years ago, I do not see, I have not had a flea or tick in our business and we are on a ranch where they have been rampant and we have never seen one anywhere inside of our building. Mm. So, yeah. So I use that now to spritz furniture, shower curtains, carpets, anything around our house. I just spritz it everywhere. Mm. Yeah, I know our dog Maddie, who used to go to Bed and Bones when she was a puppy. (laughs) And I remember one day she hoarded all the tennis balls that you threw in (laughs) and she would stare at the chicken. She thought that was fun. Um, I don't know if she actually interacted with other dogs, but (laughs) she two years ago started to really decline medically, physically, and even mentally. And we switched out all the chemicals, switched out, changed her food to something healthier. And she lived two more years. And it made such a huge difference. And I think with a daycare, you wouldn't even think to ask, what are you cleaning the floors with that my dog's going to walk on, you know? Yes. And um, especially because um, many, many um, companies are selling cleaning products to facilities to clean up urine and um, urine and feces. And let me tell you, if you walk into a facility and you smell feces, it is nauseating. And then you mix that with bleach and you really want to like, and these dogs have so many more smell receptors. So if you think it's annoying to you, I can only imagine what it's doing to your dog. So I always tell people, you definitely have to pay attention to what a place smells like when you walk in. That's huge. And with a purely indoor facility, that will tell you what the air filtration system is doing or not doing. Yes. Huge and, for an indoor facility. Yes. Yeah. And, and I have to tell you, I mean, there is nothing more fun for me than getting together with another doggy daycare owner and swapping stories because you will hear things that you cannot believe. Mm-hmm. So um, as an owner, you don't want to be the crazy owner because then they don't want you as a, as a client but you definitely want to just pay attention and listen to what they're telling you. And your dog also will tell you whether it wants to be there or not. So look at your dog's right. If he doesn't want to get out of the car, it could be he's tired. You brought him too many times this week, but it could be that um, something's happening and he's not having fun anymore. Mm -hmm. And then you need to bring that conversation up and go, should I come on a different day? Is there a group of dogs that come on Thursday that don't really match up with my dog because there are days where we'll tell people your dog is better suited for Monday and Friday. Mm. And, you know, Tuesday, Thursday is um, Frisbee dog day and your dog hates it when every dog is running to catch Frisbees Mm. or um, we have too many border collies on that day and they do a lot of rounding up and your dog does not enjoy that. Yeah, that's a good point. And just having um, an a doggy daycare owner that's honest about what's really going on. Even if you don't want to hear the information, you need to know what's really happening there. With yes. Yourself. Yes. And um, we never try to make somebody feel bad, but there are times where we tell people we are not the right place for your dog. And if somebody says that their place is right for everybody run mm-hmm. because not every place is right for every owner or every dog. And sometimes it's just not a good fit. And we will say, this place is a better fit for your dog. That's good to have another place to send them. You know, that's, that is a better fit. Yes. And for us, because we're outside, if Mm -hmm. you have a dog that has escape tendencies that can climb and jump fences that, um, will run away and not come when you call, we're not the right place. Because the last thing I wanna do is chase a dog on 15 acres. I've done that before with an Akita. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, it was a 45 minute, and it wasn't like being bad. It was just, I'm gonna run 20 feet ahead of you, wait for you to catch up and run 20 more feet. (laughs) 
my gosh. <laughs> that's not a small, that's not a small, timid dog either. <laughs> no, but you know, we eventually realized that if we drove our car and opened the door, the dog would jump into the back seat. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but yeah, so actually, if we see a dog with escape tendencies, that's a that's a decline right at the trial. When we tell yeah. them, we see that your dog has this uh, tendency to want to escape. Mm -hmm. So we would recommend an indoor facility. Yeah, that's for the dog safety. I worked at a dog daycare that was new and dog daycare was a new thing. And they took every dog, I mean, to an extreme degree, they should not have taken all those dogs. They put too many together. They had one that jumped up over the fence, ran across an extremely busy road. I mean, you do not want your dog to go through anything like that, especially when you're not there. Oh my gosh, could you imagine? Yes, and we have, um, and, and I have to say that even with behaviors, like we had a dog that was jumping up and it was probably a 95 pound dog. And I told the owner, we have a little issue with your dog. It jumps on people and it's 95 pounds and it jumped on her and she grabbed its feet and she goes, no, that's the way my dog and I dance. Oh no. <laughs> and she, so um, not too much long maybe two, a month or so after she called me and she said, we had a problem with our dog. It jumped on an older woman and knocked her down. Oh no. And this was not, the dog did not think it was being bad. She thought that that was totally appropriate behavior. Yeah. And I said, did it break the woman's hip? And she said, it did. Oh. And I said, are you being sued? And she said, yes, I am. Mm. And I said, can I recommend a trainer? And she said, yes, you can. Wow. So sometimes if they give you information, you definitely want to pay attention to what they're telling you. Mm -hmm. Now, have you ever had a dog fight in your groups? Yes. Um, we had, um, we had a dog, um, uh, that came after my, um, great Pyrenees. And now he was trained that the dogs in the yard were all his and he was a very large dog and this other dog came after him and um, he was trained to just take his foot and push the dog to the ground and hold it. Um, but we have, anytime that there's even a small rah, 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 um, we have the incident report and we go, we check the whole body. We make sure, was there anything that happened? And um, we quickly um, call the owner and say, this is what happened. Our first reaction is we will try and attempt to call your vet. If your vet allows us to come, we will bring it to your vet. If your vet says, no, we don't have, we don't have the ability to take it. We have a vet right down the street that we trust and we take the dog there. Usually here, we don't have like an aggressive fight because we've already like let those through, but we've had where we had a puppy beagle that grabbed onto a dog's ear mm. as a puppy and held onto it and tore the ear. Mm. And that's why we say when puppies are mouthing you, you give them something to mouth, you never let them mouth your hand. Um, you know, because people think it's fun, with, especially when you have a lot, if you have like three boys at home, it's going to be a problem. But you really want to teach them early on that mouthing is inappropriate in any way, and especially in doggy daycare. So that was just an issue of training. Um, so things do happen. We did have a lady show up with a, a wolf before. So obviously that's not an appropriate um, setting for our daycare. So we declined that dog, but I could tell you that for sure there would have been a dog fight with that, mm. with that dog. Um, if I have a dog that's questionable, there are certain breeds that um, I, I'm really more careful with. So we had a Rottweiler come. I would say one out of 10 passes and I let people know on the phone ahead of time, you're going to come in, you're going to pay for a trial, but your dog may not pass. The owner was sure that the dog was going to be good, came into a yard. I was standing there waiting to see how it would react and it postured. And then my dog's like, are you kidding? I have to do this. <laughs> so then they get up and posture. So, um, I'm going, okay, this is not going to end well. I had a Frisbee. I just threw it in front of the dog's face, got the dog's attention, grabbed the dog and moved it out of the yard. So I would never have taken that dog and put it into my doggy daycare. I have to know how it's going to react way before I put it in. And a lot of times the howdy area will even tell me that. Mm. 
Yeah, I think it's reasonable to assume your dog could get a scratch from playing with another dog. But yes. I don't think it's reasonable to, I mean, fights can happen <clears throat> because it's a group of strange dogs, you know, and they're animals. But if it's being managed well, you should be had, there should be enough preemptive strikes in place that it most likely will never get to that escalated point. Yes. And, and I have to say though, that we've had dogs, especially boxers that like to play with their feet mm -hmm. that have scratched and torn skin by the way they play. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are things that can happen. We've had another dog that was running you know, and then looking back while it's running and smashed into something and cut himself. And when we explained it to the owner exactly what happened, they went, yep, that sounds like my dog. So <laughs> usually you can tell if that's something that actually has taken place or not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think of that as a red flag. If you hear about a place that has a bunch of dog fights and, you know, dogs always going to the hospital or God forbid dying or something like that, that maybe you don't want to go to that place. And I know where I used to live, there was a place like that, that took so many dogs and they had this reputation of dogs being injured and killed and people just went there, you know? And again, it's the California thing. The rent was very high it's not conducive to having a good business sometimes, you know, that, so it's not always their fault. It's just, you want to look at these things to make sure it's the right place. Yes. And um, I have to say that our biggest problem here, I think with dogs and our facility is Giardia. Hmm. Because it's so highly contagious that if um, dogs can be carriers and not even shed the virus until they get into a stressful situation, they're exhausted, they're tired, something different, and then they can shed it. And that is something that is so contagious, it can even pass through to people. Mm -hmm. We can tell very quickly when a dog has Giardia just by looking at the feces, so we'll get an incident report. But the problem is you can have 10 dogs have Giardia in two days from one dog coming in with it. And they're, and even if we ask them to test for it, if they go to a dog park, if they walk their dog at the beach, if they're around other dogs, they can pick it up from the time they were tested to the time they came in. Mm -hmm. So that's just one of those things that is probably gonna happen. You need to be aware of it. Um, I tell people when you go for your vet appointment, ask them for um, like, uh, uh, there's a, a, a pill called Flagyl and literally one dose cleans it right up. And you just say, do you mind? I'm going to be taking my dog um, for daycare or boarding over Christmas. If I can pick one up just in case they come back with, you know, Giardia. Mm -hmm. um, so that I think is a big problem in California. I don't know how it is in the rest of the country. Yeah, I think dog parks for sure, that's a big problem because dogs are running through poop and pee and stepping in the water bowl and then everyone's yeah. drinking it and there's no regulation at all. Yes. But yeah, I think it is. And stress can cause diarrhea too, you know, in yeah. dogs. So it's a new and, thing. And people sometimes when they, um, they'll switch dog food and not do it carefully yeah. and that can cause some stomach issues. Um, new brand new treats that they've never had. Like everything has to be done in a very controlled way so that you can mm -hmm. see, um, is my dog tolerating, tolerating this? Or is, let's face it, I can't eat everything that I would like to eat. <laughs> Nor should you. <laughs> exactly. That is the bigger point. Nor should I. Yeah. <laughs> wow, Tammy, this has been such a wealth of information. I, is there... Any last bit you want to throw out? I think you've given us every single thing I could think of. Yeah, no, I think that um, for the most part, um, do I believe that doggy daycare is good for dogs? Yes, I think it's. It, I think you want your dog to be able to get along with other dogs. Mm -hmm. um, be careful. I don't really. Um, I don't really agree with dog parks because I don't think that they're managed. So I say. For most people, find a group of neighbors where your dogs get along and let them play in that kind of a group, um, as opposed to going to a uh, giant area where, you know, 
dogs are just at a free for all and you have no idea who's been vaccinated and who hasn't. So the owners that tend to be more careful are probably ones that make sure that their dogs are all up to date on everything. Mm, that's good. Management, management, management. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Well, Tammy, my gosh, thank you so much. I'm glad we were able to get the audio and the video to work. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry about that. I don't know. Oh, what gosh. That, I'm sure that was on my end somewhere. <laughs> I just don't know. But yeah, so if you send me links to all of your, um, to Bed and Bones, and I can put those in the descriptions, and we'll get that information out there for anyone who wants to come to South Orange County for dog heaven, it sounds like. <laughs> Thank you, Tricia. Oh my gosh. Well, thanks so much, Tammy. It was so good to see you. Nice to see you too. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.